This is Charles Manover. I am co-editor of a new book from SAGE, Analyzing and Interpreting Qualitative Research. And I am here with um, Andrea J. Bigham um, from um, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, who's going to talk with us about um, deductive and inductive approaches to qualitative analysis and help people sort of envision the different mindsets and frames that people move back and forth in during analysis. Um, Andrea, could you talk a little bit about your research and then we'll just move right in. Sure, um, so hi everyone, I'm very happy to be here. Um, this was a really exciting book chapter for me to write um, with my co-author, Dr. Patty Witkowski, who's also the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. Um, I, here at the University of Colorado, teach um, introductory and advanced qualitative methods to doctoral students. I also teach research methods for um, graduate students and uh, policy analysis, which draws on some qualitative work as well. So I spend a lot of time doing that. Um, and that's partially where this book chapter kind of came from, was seeing what students do and what they struggle with and what information they need um, to move forward with their studies. Uh, as far as my research goes, I'm an education researcher and I study mainly education policy implementation, um, particularly how teachers implement innovative teaching practices um, using technology uh, and how schools as organizations change as they implement technological uh, reforms and things like that. So that's generally what I look at. Um, I have spent a lot of time researching personalized learning. So if you read the book chapter, that references a study that I've done on personalized learning. Um, and I will talk today, I'll do give some examples from a study on uh, competency-based learning, which is a form of, um, a form of instruction where teachers uh, measure student progress based on competency and not on seat time. And, uses a lot of technology. So a little background information there. Um, I am a qualitative researcher, if that's not clear from, from our conversation. And uh, I'm also very excited about uh, and passionate about the use of theory in qualitative research. And I actually myself am in the midst of currently writing a book on um, the use of theoretical and conceptual frameworks in qualitative research. So I'll talk a little bit about how that fits in with deductive and inductive analysis strategies as well today. Okay, um, to start, why don't you just give an overview um, deductive, inductive analysis for people that are um, just coming to qualitative research. Could you walk through the distinction and help them sort of understand why it's so critical for our work? Sure. So, um, Generally, uh, I would say that qualitative data analysis or data analysis generally can be divided into two um, types of analysis, deductive and inductive analysis. Inductive analysis is what is typically associated with qualitative research. And I would argue, and many would argue, that it must be a part of all qualitative studies. Um, so I'll explain what those two things are. So deductive analysis, which is also sometimes referred to as a priori analysis, usually means um, applying predetermined categories or codes, applying theory to the data, um, and then seeing kind of does the data fit in those categories, fit in those theories or in that theory in order to test that theory. Um, or developing a hypothesis and seeing whether the data fits into that hypothesis. So it's, it's more of a uh, top-down form of data analysis um, where codes and categories are predetermined. Inductive analysis, on the other hand, um, as I said, is kind of like the, the core of qualitative work. And that is really more of a bottom-up strategy of analysis where you're looking at the data to see what's there, to, ident to identify um, themes and codes and categories that exist within the data without pre-applying um, codes that you've developed. So those are kind of the general two forms of qualitative analysis. Um, and I believe that utilizing both in 
a study, utilizing both as you're going through um, your qualitative data analysis is the best way to really do a trustworthy, rigorous qualitative study. Um, there are lots of different ways to do that. So I will talk today about how I have done that um, and how I've seen others do it, but it's certainly not the only way. Just a briefly, like what's the benefit of moving between these two approaches? So what do you get out of it before we go into the... Sure. So um, I think once we go through kind of the, the cycles of analysis that incorporate deductive and inductive strategies, it'll become a little bit clearer with some examples. Um, but what I see as being the benefit of using both is that Firstly, deductive analysis can help you organize your data. It can help you maintain focus on your research questions and your research purpose. Um, and it can also ensure that you are keeping one eye on the existing theory and on the existing literature and helps you to situate um, your findings within those things. So that's kind of the strengths of deductive analysis. But inductive analysis, as I've said a few times now, is really kind of the, the key to qualitative work. So um, inductive analysis allows us to see what's in the data and to allow um, for ourselves to identify, to identify what's there without imposing our own ideas on it a priori, if that makes sense. So, um, so really that's the key strength of qualitative work in the contextualization and in understanding um, you know, what's actually there in the data. What are the participants saying? What are we seeing um, without, you know, having, without imposing um, pre-developed ideas on that? So I think those two things together um, helps maintain a balance. Okay, and I am going to share my screen, and maybe you can um, you can discuss um, this chart. So, um, tell people what this chart is, and then how we're going to how and why we're going to walk through. Sure. Okay, so um, in first thinking about this book chapter and outlining kind of what I wanted it to look like, I wanted to really walk through my process of data analysis in a way that made almost in a, a meta analytic way, uh, a metacognitive way um, that really kind of walked through each step that I was taking as I was analyzing data. Um, and so what that ended up being, what I recognized there was that really what I was doing when I'm analyzing qualitative data is conducting these kind of five cycles of analysis that are divided into deductive um, cycles and inductive cycles. And so that's sort of where this came from, these five cycles. So that's, that's what this is, is um, just a flow chart of what each of those cycles of analysis look like. And um, why don't you take us through it? Sure. All right. So um, the first two cycles, as you can see here in this chart, are deductive cycles. So I'm engaging in deductive analysis in these two cycles. The first one is really um, a pretty foundational organizational cycle. So really what we're doing here is what's called attribute coding. And that is organizing the data by data type. And so by that, I mean um, where the data was collected, the time period, the location, um, what kind of data it is. Is it an interview, an observation? Um, who was the interview with? Those kinds of uh, organizational categories in order to just get yourself organized. And I, I have found that um, I, I use in vivo qualitative data analysis software, but I think this is applicable across different kinds of um, qualitative analysis softwares, you know, Quarkos, Quarkos uh, Deduce, Atlas TI, whatever it is that you're using, um, doing this kind of organizational attribute coding just helps you identify where your data is coming from. So it, it just helps you organize yourself. Um, it also gives you the opportunity to do some memoing around your data uh, collection and potential analysis processes. So just some transparency memoing 
I guess is what I would call that. Um, and if it's been a minute since you've looked at some of the data, it also kind of gives you the opportunity just to remind yourself of what's there. So that's the first cycle. The second cycle requires a little bit more um, analytic work on the researcher's part. And this is another deductive cycle where you have looked at your research questions and um, you are creating deductive topical categories that are aligned to those research questions. So I'll give some examples in just a minute, but I'll just talk about it generally here. Um, and the idea there is that you are sorting the data into categories that are relevant to your research question in order to help you maintain focus on those research questions. Um, here again, memoing uh, is, you know, thinking about kind of first impressions that you're having of the data as you're reading through it. So this isn't really um, hardcore data analysis, but it is kind of this sorting um, that's happening just to make sure that you're kind of keeping an eye on what's going to be relevant for your research question. Because as we all know, qualitative data uh, can get very big, <laughs> right, and unwieldy. And so these first two cycles are really about organization and relevance and um, maintaining focus on your purpose. So then we get into cycles three and four, which are focused on inductive analysis. So cycle three really engages in um, a key analytic strategy in qualitative research, and that is open coding, um, as well as in vivo coding. And the idea there is to look for, just kind of do a first pass looking for um, emerging ideas in the data, right? So looking for what's there. Um, and starting to, to code and categorize that. Um, memoing in this process for me often revolves around um, creating a, a, a coding guide. So starting to define my codes, um, maybe starting to condense them, identifying key ideas in the data. So that is cycle three. And that leads us into cycle four, which I think is really where um, cycles four and five are where a lot of the analytic heavy lifting happens. So in cycle four, um, it's another cycle of inductive analysis and you're drawing on pattern coding and starting to develop your themes. Um, so really the idea here is to kind of go do another pass through the data, um, looking at your codes, starting to condense those codes into patterns, condensing those patterns into themes, and then further developing findings from those themes. Um, the purpose here is really to identify answers to your research questions. So for me, um, memoing in this particular cycle becomes really important. Uh, I will often keep a running memo of my research questions and um, you know, just start typing answers and writing and doing some work there based on uh, how my patterns have turned into themes. Um, many qualitative researchers will kind of use themes and findings interchangeably. I do not use them interchangeably. I look at themes as being kind of um, more general categories. So I'll use maybe a word or a phrase to identify a theme. And then what I'll do is I'll take those uh, words or phrases that are themes and turn them into kind of a finding statement that answers the research question. And I'll give an example of what that looks like in just a minute. Um, but really this, this cycle is very big for, uh, for the qualitative inductive work. It's where you're really starting to answer your research questions. You're pulling representative data. Um, if you're doing a qualitative case study, you might be developing case summaries. Um, or you're starting, maybe if you're doing a narrative inquiry, you're starting to kind of pull together those narratives here. Um, and so the product here is the findings. But as we know, that's not the end of the analytic process, right? So you have to go beyond just what are the findings. We've got our discussion, right? We have to figure out what do those findings mean? Why are they important? Um, how are they situated within the literature, within the theory? And so that leads into cycle five, which is kind of a combined um, deductive and inductive cycle. So one of the main processes here is theoretical coding. And um, I would also say literature coding. So here there's a deductive process of developing codes from the literature, developing codes from whatever theoretical framework you're using, 
and applying those codes to the data. So seeing where your data fits in terms of the theory and the literature. Um, that's deductive in that you are creating those, those codes ahead of time, uh, but it's inductive in that you are having to see what's there in the data and um, make sense of that within the framework or within the literature. Um, so the purpose there is really to, to explain your findings. Um, I will do a process of what is called analytic questioning, where I'll sort of have um, in a memo, I'll have a list of questions that are um, questions like, what do the interviews tell me about this phenomenon, whatever the phenomenon is that I'm investigating, and um, just sort of memoing in response to that to, to get a better understanding of what my findings might mean in a more general sense um, and what the implications of those findings are. So the end uh, result there is theory-based, literature-based explanation of your findings. So if you've gone through all these five cycles, um, you should have a nicely developed kind of findings. Um, you should have answers to your research questions. And then you also should have that additional step of being able to explain what those findings mean and why they're important. So maybe a quick question. Mm -hmm. um, just to help folks. Um, in cycle three, mm -hmm. you move from deductive analysis to inductive and open coding and vivo coding. Could you just tell how, what the difference is? How does that feel? What, what parts of your mind are you drawing on? Sure. Yeah. And I should mention too, that between cycles two and three, so what, what's happening there is that I've sorted the data in cycle two into categories that are aligned to my research questions, right? In my qualitative data analysis software, I can kind of look at things that are cross-coded. So for example, if I'm doing a study um, on how teachers are using technology to personalize their instruction, I might have some cross-codes um, I might have coded data by personalization. I might have also coded data by technology. So I can start to kind of look at those cross codes or look at those individual codes and do my inductive analysis within those categories. So that's kind of that step I didn't really talk about. Um, and so what's going on in my mind when I get to cycle three is I'm trying to see this is this sort of black box of qualitative data analysis that that through writing about these cycles i'm trying to kind of make that a little bit more transparent but there is still always something kind of going on in your brain where you're you're reading through the data and you're making sense of it you're categorizing it you're trying to be open to um what are the participants experiences what are the things that are happening here in this particular study um, and so I may be reading the data, reading through the data within those categories, but it's less about, um, the categories themselves and more about, okay, now what can I identify? What can I name in the data? Um, how can I be open to seeing, you know, what might be new there, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I think that sounds great. And then another question. Um, one of the things that impressed me about this process was the level of intention. And then particularly in the memoing, could you talk like, so you're coding, but you're memoing as you go. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, okay, so I, I am a huge memoer and a huge advocate for the importance of memoing. And I think there's several different reasons why it's important. And um, each of these cycles, as you can see here, kind of on this, on this flow chart, uh, has different kinds of memos associated with it, um, for me at least. And so one, one reason that I see memoing as being important is that it can increase trustworthiness by uh, offering you the opportunity to record your process and be transparent about how you've collected data, how you've analyzed data, questions that have come up for you, codes that you've developed, categories that you've developed, the process that you're using. 
Um, so that transparency around methods and methodological processes, I think is really important and key to the rigor and the trustworthiness of the study. So I see that as being kind of one form of memoing, um, recording your own decisions, recording your own process, all of that. Um, and then kind of this other form of memoing where it's almost, um, you know, analytic free writing is what I'll call it. Um, and this is happening for me primarily in um, cycles three, four, and five, where uh, I will, you know, kind of free write about things I might, I'm starting to see in the data. Um, as I mentioned, one um, important type of memo for me is that I will list out my research questions on a memo and I will just start writing, particularly in cycle four. Um, you know, I've got, I've, I've done some open coding. I've, I've seen kind of things emerging from the data. I'm starting to get some ideas about how these uh, condense into themes and findings. So writing that memo, um, kind of responding to the research questions by thinking about what I'm seeing in the data, that is a key memo for me. And oftentimes I'm pulling directly from that when I'm actually writing up the report. Um, and it's kind of the same thing in cycle five. I'll, I'll create an additional memo that, um, you know, is kind of the beginnings of a discussion section where I'm saying to myself, okay, so here's what I, here's what I, found in the course of doing this study, why, why is that important? Or what, what recommendations might I have? Or how does this fit within um, what we already know, whether it be from theory or from literature? And so that memo, you know, will often roll itself into my discussion section, or, you know, if specific ideas about recommendations I might have for practice policy or future research pop up, I will jot them down there. Um, so those are those kind of more analytic um, memos about what's actually going on in the data and why it's important. Um, and then I was gonna mention one more and, oh, I know what it was. Um, and so then sort of a third type is uh, pulling key um, pieces of data. So evidentiary support for the findings that I've developed, um, if I'm seeing especially important quotes or especially relevant or interesting or shocking or whatever it happens to be, um, I will pull those and put them in a memo um, and, you know, do some analytic work around what does this mean? Um, how would I write about this? How would I incorporate this into the write-up um, for each of these findings? So that's kind of like three important types of memos. Uh, that fit within these cycles. One more question, and then maybe we'll go to the next slide. Um, just a basic one. What does your coding do for you? So I understand like the memo and how that leads to the final products in your analysis. What does the coding do? How does it benefit? Oh gosh, um, that's like sim simultaneously a really difficult and easy question. I, it's, um, so depending on what we're talking about, if we're talking about deductive, deductive or inductive coding, um, I think both are helpful in terms of organization, right? So just um, maintaining focus and ensuring that you know you have names for what's going on in the data, right? Whether they're developed. Um, a priori, so whether they're deductive codes that you've developed ahead of time, um, or they're inductive codes where you're naming concepts and you're naming ideas as you're seeing them in the data, that's organizing your thoughts. That's, you know, or organizing the work that you're doing. So I see it, I see them as organizational. Um, and then also just, I, I don't know how I can describe it beyond it it's a way to do the analytic work in a transparent way, um, in a way that ensures that your study is credible, right? Um, so that so that it's not just, hey, I read through this and here's what I see, right? Like I'm just going to write up what I what I think is going on. It provides a tr a trail, right? From 
just the raw data to your interpretation of the data. Those codes, that's the key role that they play a key role in getting from raw data to interpretation. Sure, I could just read through my data and start writing, right? Um, but then there's no, uh, there's no trail, there's no support for how I got from point A to point B. Um, so that's, that's kind of how I see inductive codes, especially as being kind of the, the linchpin or the, the um, key way to get from raw data to interpretation. Can you tell us before we go on anything that you've learned? So a specific thing you've learned from your code. Oh gosh, um, specific thing I've learned from my coding. Or we were surprised by the code. Yeah. So um, as I said earlier, I think in writing this chapter, it really forced me to reflect on and flesh out specifically what I was doing when I was doing my data analysis. And I think that's certainly something that I've seen my students struggle with. It's something that I, you know, talked with other faculty about, about, as I said, the black box of qualitative data analysis, where there, there's this process going on in your brain where you're making sense of what's happening there in the data, but it's not always, it's not always clear how you got from point A to point B. And, you know, I've always done coding and this was kind of the process that was happening, but I had never written it out so explicitly before. And so I think that writing this chapter for me, not only was it very helpful in just fleshing out specifically what what was happening in my mind and what was I doing, um, but also better communicates that. Um, and it certainly helped, I think it certainly helped me better communicate, better communicate to my students what the process can look like, um, especially if you are trying to be as transparent as possible as from, for how you got from the raw data to your actual findings. Um, and I have noticed, and I think this is a positive development, that in submitting articles to journals in the past, you know, five years or so, um, I'm getting more and more requests now from reviewers when I'm getting revised to revise and resubmit a, an article, I'm getting more requests for additional information on data analysis. How did you get from point A to point B? What did that look like? What were your codes? How were they defined? Um, and I love that. I think that's so important. And uh, it's not something that we've, that we've always seen, right? So I, I appreciate that I'm seeing more and more requests for just uh, additional transparency in coding and in, anal and in analysis strategies. And that's great. Um, tell us about this chart now. Sure. So um, what we were just talking about was kind of very general around what each of those cycles could look like. This uh, comes from, from an actual study. So this is, this is coming from um, a study of competency-based learning. Uh, and let's see if I can remember what my research question was. Um, it, oh, so the research question was how do teachers implement competency based learning in their classrooms, right? And so um, just kind of keep that research question in mind. Uh, and this is just an example of the codes that I developed in each cycle of analysis in the course of conducting that study. So we have that first cycle of deductive analysis that has the attribute coding, right? So um, this example is there, this is an observation. The data is observational data. Uh, the time point was fall of 2018. The participant, this is a pseudonym, was Dr. Hernandez. So that's just kind of the organizational attribute coding. Um, and then we've got cycle two, which is also deductive. Um, and I developed two topic codes based on that research question and based on kind of the general categories of interest I had in my research purpose. And so that was data analysis, um, how are teachers analyzing data and data-driven classroom practice. Um, and then we jump into cycle three, the green band there, and that is where we move into inductive analysis. So in reading through the data that I had um, sorted into those topic codes, data analysis and data-driven classroom practice. These were some of the open codes that 
I uh, created as I was identifying concepts and ideas in the data. So technology use and data transparency and real-time data analysis, those um, emerged in reading through uh, the data that was previously coded under data analysis. And then the open codes ability grouping and levels, um, as in student levels, um, those emerged when reading through the data that had been coded as data-driven classroom practice. So those were the open codes that came, uh, not all of them, but just some examples of the open codes that came out of that third cycle of inductive analysis. So then moving into the fourth cycle, if you'll recall, that's where you're kind of condensing those open codes into patterns and then to themes and then to findings. Um, so as I said, I prefer to uh, identify themes as words or short phrases. So three of the themes that emerged in this study were um, real-time data analysis, data transparency, and database stability grouping. And so in looking at those themes, I then kind of took those and turned them into finding statements. And those findings in response to um, how do teachers implement competency-based learning in their classrooms, uh, data transparency supports real-time data analysis, real-time data analysis encourages ability grouping. So those were two findings that emerged in the study or that were identified in the study. And then moving into cycle five, so trying to understand, okay, so, but what do those findings mean in a larger sense? Um, how do they fit within existing theory? How do they fit within existing research? Um, and so we've got, uh, I was using, I didn't mention this before, but in this study, I was using sense-making theory. And one code from sense-making theory is assimilation. And that is just the idea that um, teachers are kind of uh, taking new practices and new ideas and assimilating them into their existing practices. And so in trying to make sense of that, uh, of those findings um, through the sense making theoretical framework, I applied that theory code assimilation and tried to understand what those findings meant um, in a larger sense. And the explanation of findings that was developed there was teachers made sense of the demands of real time data analysis through a process of assimilation. Rather than reconstructing their existing beliefs about teaching, they used new practices, real time data analysis and data transparency to facilitate old practices, ability grouping. So that was just kind of what um, this is a sentence, I think, that went directly into my discussion section um, of those particular findings. So that just sort of walks you through uh, what those cycles look like using an actual study, kind of an ongoing study. How did you, um, when you started this process in cycle one, like, were you sure you were going to get to this theory code of assimilation in cycle five, or could you talk a little bit about that journey? That you were sure, about? and I think uh, I think there are, there not I think, I know there are varying views on when one should apply theory in their analysis process. Um, of course, I think it comes into play if you've, you know, you've done a literature review and you've, you have an idea of what theoretical framework you might use. Um, that may in fact show up in cycle two, right? Um, it's it's kind of up to the individual researcher where they feel it best fits in relation to what their research questions are. For me, um, I knew I was going to use sense-making theory. And I knew that because of the literature I'd read because of my prior experience doing research um, and because of the kinds of research questions I was asking, which were kind of focused on how teachers were, were making sense of a reform and um, how the organization might change collectively in response to how teachers were making sense of a reform. So I knew that sense-making theory was, was going to make sense for the study. Um, so I did choose to use that ahead of time. It may be that, uh, you know, in a more purely inductive study, people may do the open coding first and say, okay, here is a theory that I think is gonna fit with this. Um, I think that's perfectly fine for me, for this study and for other studies I've done. 
if I know what theoretical framework I'm going to use because I, I have experience with it or I know it's going to fit. Um, I wouldn't say that I knew assimilation was going to show up. Mm -hmm. I would say that as I was looking at my findings through the lens of sense making theory, I saw that what teachers were doing was assimilation, right? Okay. I could yeah. have seen that they were doing uh, what's called schema reconstruction, which would be that they were taking the new information and say, and it was changing the way they were viewing their teaching and changing the way that they were um, instructing their students. So that could have emerged, um, but assimilation was what did emerge. So I could create those deductive codes based on the theory. And some of those codes may just not pan out, right? I didn't see schema reconstruction happening in this study, but I did see assimilation. So as I applied that theory code, I could, I could then, um, I could then talk through the findings in relation to that theory code, but not in relation to others. That's great. Um, anything else on this slide or we'll, we will move towards the end? I think that's it. Okay, so um, this is the chapter from you and your colleague, um, Patricia Witkowski. Mm -hmm. Am I saying that right? Um, yeah. Deductive and inductive approaches to qualitative data analysis, um, which is a chapter in our new book from SAGE, Analyzing and Interpretive Qualitative Research After the Interview. Um, any suggestions for either beginning researchers that are trying to do this and use the chapter itself, or teachers that are thinking of using the chapter before we go? Mm -hmm. um, suggestions for beginning researchers or for people who are using the chapter. Um, I would emphasize a couple of things, and I think I would probably say that if you're teaching qualitative methods, I would um, ask you to emphasize these things as well. And that would be uh, the importance, first of all, of memoing, right? Um, I think that incorporating memoing throughout each of those cycles and throughout a process of deductive and inductive analysis. Um, I think memoing is absolutely critical to not only um, developing important findings that are data-based, um, but also in situating those findings within the literature and within the theory. Um, but I also think memo memoing is absolutely critical in ensuring that you are demonstrating that there was a trustworthy process for getting from the raw data to the interpretation um, and supporting your findings that way. So I would say emphasizing the memoing piece, um, both within the deductive, uh, deductive cycles and the inductive cycles, I would say is important. Um, and then I would also say that I know that there are um, many qualitative researchers who do not, who maybe don't see the use of deductive um, analysis as a qualitative strategy or, you know, who maybe shy away from it because they don't want to be imposing uh, predetermined categories onto the data. And I would say in, in certain studies that makes sense, right? In a grounded theory, you're not going to be creating um, deductive codes from the literature to apply right up front, right? But I think that no matter what kind of qualitative study you're doing, there's a role for deductive analysis, whether it is, you know, just engaging in that first cycle of uh, organizational coding, um, or whether it's engaging in the first and the second cycles in terms of um, just organizing by research question. I think uh, well, I would argue that inductive analysis is absolutely critical and must be included in any qualitative analysis, any qualitative study. Um, I would also argue that incorporating deductive processes in there to organize yourself at the very least uh, can make for a more balanced, more trustworthy study. So I, I would emphasize that as well. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, we appreciate the time you
Cave. There is a blog post connected to this. I will be linking it both. Um, the blog post will be posted at Sage Method Space. I'll link the um, Sage Method Space link um, to the um, YouTube video. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here.